my my message this morning um, would be a blessing to everyone but I just thought to also use the opportunity to honor the fathers and so I'm teaching on the topic that I title Abba Father Abba Father Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9 There are many names that God is called in the Bible. He's called Almighty, El Shaddai, El Gibor. The Bible is full of the various names of God. And when Jesus showed up, he was teaching what we call the Lord's Prayer. And he was giving them a pattern that would guide them whilst praying. And he said, in this manner, therefore, pray. And he said, our Father. In other words, when you submit yourself to prayer, you must come with the consciousness that you are not just praying to God, but you are praying to Father. Hallelujah. So the first point I want to establish this morning is that the Almighty God is also Father. As simple as this point is, it will alter your understanding of God when you know Him as Father. Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 5, 5 and 6, Deuteronomy 32 and verse 5, the Bible in the Old Testament refers to God as Father, even though, theologically speaking, the concept of God's fatherhood was known when Jesus was revealed. Until the manifestation of Jesus, it was difficult for them to understand God as Father. Because the dealings of men with God was shrouded in a lot of mysticism. He worked with mediators like Moses, Joshua. And so the people did not have the privilege of a personal relationship. That concept of a personal relationship did not exist until Jesus came. Are we together? So they would have to depend on men who had a covenant with God. And whatever templates they were given from those men would be their understanding of God. For instance, Moses would climb up the mountain and interact with God alone. Then come down and give them the law and everything that he believed God told him. So they were limited by the understanding of God that was proposed to them by their leaders. Are we together now? Yeah. So verse 6. Let's look at it. Just a few scriptures to establish the fact that God is also called Father. Deuteronomy 32 5 and 6. It says, Do you thus deal with the Lord, O foolish and unwise people? Is that KJV? I appreciate KJV. It says, Is he not your father who brought you? He's speaking to a stiff necked people now. He's saying, Did you know that it took the fatherhood of God? Thank you. He says, Hath he not made thee and established thee? So the Bible acknowledges God as father. Isaiah 63. And verse 16 Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 16 is the next scripture we'll consider establishing the fact that the Almighty God is father Isaiah 63 16 it says doubtless thou art our father though Abraham be ignorant of us and Israel acknowledge us not thou O Lord art our father our Redeemer thy name is from everlasting you believe that? Say amen. amen. So the Bible establishes the fact that God Almighty is Father. The second point I want us to understand in this discussion is that Jesus revealed and established the fatherhood of God when he walked upon the earth. Now you see, there are many reasons why Jesus walked upon the earth. Ultimately, was to reconcile man to God. But you need to understand that many other things happened. Jesus came as a revelation of the Father. The Bible says no man had seen the Father at any time. So he came as the incarnate of the Father. That the invisible Father who had been shrouded in a lot of mysticism, Jesus came as a revelation of the father and here's what jesus had to say about the father matthew 11 27 is god blessing someone already matthew 11 27 the bible says matthew 11 27 the book of matthew thank you it says all things are delivered unto me of my father 
And no man knoweth the Son, he says, but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son. And he to whomsoever the Son shall reveal. So Jesus, you know, one of the reasons why the scribes and the Pharisees were angry at Jesus was that he brought a dimension of relationship to God that, that was against their prior understanding of God. So they knew God as some deity somewhere with all kinds of emotional swings. If you were at the wrong side of his emotions, then you would die. If for any reason, per chance, you happen to attract his favor, then you would rise. And Jesus came and began to dispel that orientation. That this almighty God we talk about is not just about killing and destroying and giving victories, but he desires a relationship. Are we together now? So the theology of Jesus centered around relationship. Not just receiving things, not just using God for triumph in battle. And the scribes and Pharisees were angry because that would mean them overhauling their end entire understanding of God until Jesus showed up no man knew that there was a possibility for such an intimate relationship with God how dare you call the creator of the heavens and the earth father there are many religions today you dare not mention God as father are we together all things are delivered of me in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 9, we read that earlier just right for reference. So Jesus is teaching to pray. And he does not mention the word God. He says when you pray, you must approach this God with a renewed orientation. Call him Father. Our Father, he said, which art in heaven. So even though you reside in a domain that is not earthly, you are still Father. And he began to show that it is possible to be in a functional relationship with God even though you may not see him physically, which art in heaven. Then he says, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. You are still speaking to the Father. He says, do not be afraid to ask the Father to give you this day your daily bread. Your daily bread is beyond food. It means all that is required for your sufficiency is called your daily bread. That means your father is that meticulous, he's that benevolent to allow you ask him even for the things that, that make for your sufficiency. And then he says, give us this day our daily bread, the next verse, and forgive us. He was introducing something about God they had not known. Forgive does he forgive? I thought he destroys. Now Jesus is saying, forgive us our debts. Even as we forgive our debtors. Then he says, lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. I assure you they were confused after that discussion. Because here is Jesus giving them another side of God. Their understanding of God was a fearsome, mighty, invisible, mysterious entity somewhere who no one can really understand. If you are lucky, he will choose a, a leader and then show him a side of him. Now Jesus is saying, listen, listen, while all of that is true, there is a deeper dimension of knowledge to God. Are we together now? And in his parables, Jesus gave many stories and illustrations to show the fatherhood of God. We may not have time to consider that, but the most classic theological representation of the fatherhood of God was revealed in the story of the prodigal son. The prodigal son uh, is a very interesting rendition of fatherhood and sonship because it starts by demonstrating the responsibility of a father like we'll be learning after now and then two sons one eventually became a rebel and it gives the son an opportunity to veer off as far as he's able to away from the father then in brokenness and repentance the son now begins to return back did you know that even in the fallen state of the prodigal son he did not forget that he had a father he said, I will arise. He forgot every, his friends left him, but the one thing that restored him was the consciousness of fatherhood. How many hired servants, he said, are with my father and I'm here feeding with the swine? He said, I will arise. 
and I will go to my father. Not God. I am still aware that no matter how broken, no matter how far, there is something about the nature of fatherhood that must be willing to restore. He was there introducing all of these dimensions of God. You're blessed already. Say amen. amen. Jesus himself in Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, Acts chapter 1 and verse 4, he left us, he said, that tarry until you receive the promise of the Father. He calls it the promise of the Father. Not just the promise of God, the promise of the Father. One last scripture, Ephesians chapter 3, please, 14 and 15. Do you love scriptures? Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. It says, for this cause... I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, verse 15, of whom the whole family. Now, this is Apostle Paul mentoring the church in Ephesus, and he's reiterating what Jesus taught them. He said, listen, when it has to do with prayer and the faith work, you must have that orientation that you are dealing with a father who has a family, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named hallelujah now the word father comes it has the aramaic expression abba the word abba is now you know theologically speaking that the old testament was largely written in hebrew and then the new testament was a combination of greek and aramaic are we together yes yeah, so the word father is the aramaic um Abba. The Greek is the word pater, P-A-T-E-R. Both of them refer to this. Please listen. To be called father means source, number one. Number two, sustainer. Number three, protector. Number four, provider. So in the mind of God, and classically speaking, um, a, an individual is described as father not just using the basis of procreation now that is important are we together now our general concept of fatherhood is any man who is able to have a child out of himself if that were true that meant that Abraham should never have been called father until the arrival of Isaac but he was acknowledged as father even before Isaac came that means we have to use other parameters, scriptural parameters. We have to go into the mind of God to understand his concept of fatherhood. Is God speaking to us already? So that the first in God's mind, whoever originates a process is called father, Abba, the originator. Number two, the sustainer of that process. That also includes family. Number three, the protector defending the interest of the people, defending the interest of the business, defending the interest of the church, whoever works in defense to protect is called Abba, Father. Finally, whoever provides. You know what it means to provide? To provide means to insist that there is no scarcity, to ensure that there is sufficiency at all times. That means in the mind of God, no matter how many children an individual has, respectfully speaking, if you do not pass this test of being a source, being a sustainer, being a protector, and being a, pro a provider, you are not Abba. Is someone learning now? Yes. So when God calls himself Father, he gives you the opportunity to vet his fatherhood. Are we together now? He's not ashamed to say, you test it. If you call me Father, find me, find a place in Scripture where I am not source. Find a place in Scripture where I do not sustain. Find a place in Scripture where I do not protect. Find a place in Scripture where I do not provide. Then you can question my fatherhood. So every the, the Bible is a compendium of the fatherhood of God. We see these attributes displayed once and again from generation to generation. The source, number one. The sustainer, number two. The protector, number three. 
the provider, number four. Are we together now? Now, classically speaking, the concept of fatherhood, and, and please understand what I'm saying, the concept of fatherhood is not a concept that is left to men, like the male species. Are we together? The male species was carved out by God to embody this concept. But it is a concept that every responsible leader must understand. That concept of being Abba is not just left to men. Because you will find yourself in many occasions where an individual who is not the man would have to play this fatherly role. And for any, if you ever find yourself in that position of leadership, then you know that the mandate still remains Abba. So it is possible for a woman to still play that role to be a source, to be a sustainer. Are we together now? If you are the CEO of a company, for instance, with respect to that organization, you are Abba. And everything a father does must be captured in your leadership. So fatherhood is really a leadership philosophy. It is not just an orientation that is left to the male gender. Are we together now? But God in his wisdom chose a male based on his arrangement of family. Are we together now? To exemplify and embody his fatherhood. If you believe this, say amen. amen. There are four assignments of fathers from scripture. Let's deal with it structurally now. Four assignments. Is God helping us already? Four assignments. And this, with, with all due respect, is now to the men as well as everyone. Number one, the first assignment of a true father is provision. No matter what else you fail in as a father, you are not supposed to fail in this. To provide does not mean to give food. To provide means to make available the resources that make for the excelling of your family. To provide means to make available the resources. In Matthew chapter 7 and verse 11, Jesus now is teaching. When you read from verse 7, he says, Ask and you shall receive, seek and you will find. When we get to verse 11, Matthew 7 and verse 11, he said, If ye being evil, I like this, know how to give good gifts to your children. Watch this. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying intrinsically that the heart of man is desperately wicked and that even in that depraved nature of man, there is still the fatherhood instinct to see your family prosper. That even a wicked man has conscience enough to know that his children should eat. Are we together now? If you being evil, he said, know how to give good gifts to your children. He says, how much more shall your father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Father, provider, provider, provider. Do you know? As I describe the functions of fathers, men, I am also giving you the prayer point to know where the devil will attack you. Because Satan's attack will be to stop you from playing this role. So if we say the first role of a man is provider, that means he will come around your finances. That means he will come around everything that will incapacitate you and render you impotent to provide will be Satan's assignment. The assignment of every man is also the point of attack of the kingdom of darkness. Provider. 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 In 1 Timothy chapter 8, chapter 5 and verse 8. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. Please help us, media. First Timothy chapter 5. The Bible says, But if any provide not for his own, is that in your Bible? He said, And specifically for those of his own house, he has denied the faith. Do you know what this means? That the faith experience of the believer is structured on the understanding of this fatherhood relationship. That means if you claim to be a Christian indeed as a man, you claim to know God and you deny fatherhood, it must be captured in your Christian experience. It says you have denied the faith 
and that individual is worse than an infidel I pray sincerely for every man and every father here that every attack on your finances, every attack on your job, whatever it is that incapacitates you so that you are not able to provide in the name of Jesus Christ, let that attack come to an end this morning. Hallelujah. There are so many men around our world who are depressed today simply because of the inability to provide imagine that you pray to God and you say Lord give me my daily bread and you hear a reply from heaven I'm so sorry I do not think I have that ability now unto him is it in your Bible who is able to do God is always able to do that's what makes him father always able to do never wanting never failing in fact the bible says he's able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think look this extent of fatherhood that even your thoughts he has the power to answer your thoughts number two the second assignment of abba as revealed from scripture is called protection please write to protect means to keep safe to protect means to stop from accessing danger protection John chapter 17 and verse 12 John 17 and verse 12 the second assignment Jesus is acting as a responsible father remember he claimed to be the son of God and that God was his father now he was exhibiting fatherhood to the disciples and here's Jesus praying while I was with them in the world I kept them in thy name that thou gavest me I have kept he says and none of them is lost but the son of perdition look at a responsible father he had to account for why Judas was not part of the fold all that you have given me I have kept and none is lost the bible says except the son of perdition and that that the scripture might be fulfilled you are a true father when you know how to protect not just to protect men to protect things to protect values hallelujah to protect the father's discipline is his attempt to protect the child from an imminent decadence and decline that will happen in the presence of lawlessness are we together now the goal of discipline is not to vent anger no when discipline becomes a channel for venting anger then it is it is an expression of the absence of self-control are we together now the primary assignment of discipline is that it comes as a vehicle that ultimately protects the child I love your destiny too much I will not expose you to failure and I love you too much to allow you laugh in error and confusion I rather you be sad with me now and say thank you tomorrow can I tell you whatever brings a man to a point where you cannot discipline those who are within your household you are signing in for failure and pain in the future this is true the Bible says a father chastises a son that he loves is that in your Bible discipline must be seen as an overall process that leads to protecting whatever God gives you in fact the Bible says I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which is committed unto him against that day We're still together say amen, amen. very quickly number three the third assignment of fathers is mentorship and growth please write mentorship and growth is the third assignment of any father when you read first John chapter 2 it's a long read from verse 1 to 14 but I'll just pick out a few scriptures Apostle John is giving us a very intelligent discussion He's speaking by the Spirit, 1 John chapter 2. And he spoke to three categories of men. It was a men discussion. I write to you, fathers. I write to you, young men. 
I write to you, children. He was addressing three generations. A child, a young man, and an elder. And he had something to tell these three groups of men. I write to you, children, that you sin not. Your tendencies, your lack of self-control, you are still exploring the world. And in exploring the world, you will explore all kinds of things that will destroy you. So I write to you to caution you. I write to you, young men, you have strength, but you may not have wisdom. You must learn to manage your strength. I write to you, fathers, because you have known through your pain and through your experience. You may not have time, but you have wisdom. So pour your wisdom to those who have strength and pour your wisdom to those who have time. Young people have time and energy, but they do not have wisdom. The elderly have wisdom, but they may not have time. So mentorship becomes that bridge that connects wisdom with time. This is why every generation must be an improvement of the next. Mentorship and growth. Is God speaking to someone? When a child becomes a foolish child, the Bible says a wise son makes a glad father, but that a foolish son is a reproach to his mother. Are we together now? That means every father here, let me charge you by God. Do not hide your scars. Use your scars as a weapon of mentorship. Teach your child that I made a mistake and at 25 I was not yet established. Now you are 17. There is something I can teach you such that when you are 21, you would have covered my results of 30 years. Mentorship. Mentorship. Hallelujah. When Pharaoh, watch this, Remember the story of God's people, Israel in Egypt. When Moses came to advocate the exodus of God's people, there was a negotiation that happened. Pharaoh said, all right, I will let the children go, but the fathers will remain. And Moses said, no, if the children go without their fathers, that is a generation without guidance. And he negotiated, all right, let the women stay and let the men go. If the women stay, there is no continuity. And he said, everyone must go. Notice how Satan, when he cannot destroy a generation, he will start fragmenting family. Men, you can go. Leave the women behind. When children do not go, there is no future. When men do not go, there is no stamina. When women do not go, there is no basis for continuity. Is someone learning now? Moses said, I'm not here to negotiate. The father, the mother... The children must go. That all three must serve. Let me charge every man here. Do not respectfully speaking. The school system is only supposed to be a support system to the training of your children. The primary assignment of every father is to sit with your children and become the clearest description of the fatherhood of God. Teach them responsibility. Teach them financial management. Teach them courtesy. Teach them honor. Let them understand the reality that confronts our world today. And you would be raising champions. They may not look like it, but look at Jesus. When he called the disciples, he did not just lay hands to ordain them. Look at the ratio of impartation to mentorship. Three years to one day. Is someone learning? Let's hurry for time. Number four, the last and the final assignment of fathers, and this is where I want to dwell for a few minutes and then we wrap up, is continuity and succession. The last and the final assignment of everyone called Abba is continuity and succession. When I watched Pastor Gandhi speak here and he was speaking about his wrapping up his moment here, I just nodded and said, this is my sermon, emotion continuity and succession you are only as great as the great person who succeeds you no the greatness of your lifetime comes to naught if there is no successor this is respectfully speaking the tragedy that we have in our world today even within people of faith 
that they excel they spend decades of their life accomplishing great strides for the kingdom and in one year their testimony comes to naught because there is no one who becomes an extension of whatever it is that they did god forbid for every man here i shout that god forbid that that your achievements your sacrifices will not be buried because of the absence of succession you believe that say amen, amen. now you know why satan is attempting to attack your child he picks out the one with the potential to be a great leader they did not happen between cain and abel the very first family satan attacked succession immediately because until adam and eve satan had never known that continuity can happen through reproduction it was only through creation it was adam and eve that were the first human species to show the possibility of continuity and satan said this is dangerous that means there can be many many people coming through the womb of a woman that will serve jesus and there was an attack on cain and he made cain kill abel the goal was that whatever it is let it stop and not continue it is why when we find people who are barren we pray and say in jesus name be healed it's more than a miracle it is the devil trying to stop the possibility of continuity he is fighting that be fruitful mandate continuity and succession proverbs chapter 13 and verse 22 i would want you to please listen i'm preaching something that i intend to preach a few weeks after now also i have the honor of preaching for the full gospel businessmen's fellowship their global conference is happening in africa and this is one of the things that i hope i'll be able to share with the men um I've been very inspired by that organization and when God granted me the grace I, I told them I said I'll come I, I think I have some things that I want to share that I have seen many people build great conglomerate empires and at the end of their life they sit empty and angry and frustrated the problem is not a financial problem the problem is continuity was this not the frustration of Abraham a great man who had everything and he said lord what will you give me seeing that i go childless let's talk about this issue of succession and he said don't worry it is not eliezer i am going to give you a child that comes from you and isaac to abraham was greater than his wealth his achievement and everything that was where god said in genesis 22 don't turn there just for your knowledge he said abraham take thy son thy only son whom thou love since he represents everything go and kill him let me see how much you love me and the bible says abraham arose early and carried isaac so today we claim the blessings of abraham but we must take the responsibility of abraham back to our discussion proverbs 13 22 proverbs 13 22 is the Lord provoking someone if you can see it projected let's read together one to read a good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the righteous most times our attention quickly goes to the B part but I want to talk about the A part the Bible says a good man that means among the many things that make a man good is his ability to have a proper system of succession can i wrap up my teaching by teaching you something about inheritance the lord opened my eyes to a very powerful revelation of inheritance to inherit means to receive by succession to inherit means to receive by succession or by will as an heir hallelujah to inherit means to receive by succession so the Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children and the Lord led me through a series of dealings and I came up with five things that every man here respectfully speaking at the end of your life if you can leave these five things for those who have come out of you you would have been a good man indeed can I run through the list as we wrap up let me request that you write it first in your heart 
and then on your paper. Number one, the first and the greatest inheritance that every man can give his son, that every leader, remember I told you fatherhood is not just left to men, the male gender alone. So this applies to everyone. Are we together? The first and the greatest inheritance you can give your son or those who come out of you. Are you ready? Your convictions. Write it down. It's amazing that most people, when we talk about inheritance, we're just thinking of land and estates and what is in the bank. And unfortunately, I hope that God steps in. There is a lawless generation that anticipates in a hurry the departure of their parents in hope that they will stumble into prepared blessings. Now, I'm not being sarcastic. It's with all due apology. But it is important that we must understand that as sons and daughters, if the only thing you get from your father is money, you failed. It's true. Your convictions, a summation of your beliefs and your philosophies. Because you know, like I do, that your life is a resultant effect of your philosophies a summation of your understanding about God, about life, about failure, about victory, the first inheritance that must be transferred from any man who is called a good man to his children are his convictions. Jesus was speaking about Abraham that I know. Genesis 18, you find that. He says, I know, verse 17 and 19, I know that Abraham will teach his household. Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I will do? Verse 18. He says, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed of him. 19. He says, for I know him. This is God testifying about a man that he will command his children and his household after him. What will be the command? That they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord might bring upon them, uh, upon Abraham, that which he had spoken. In other words, he's saying, teach your children whatever made our relationship functional. Transfer that conviction to your children. Number two. The second inheritance that every man must leave with his children is your name. Your name. Your name is a capture of your track record, your credibility, your impact, your value, your contribution. Let me take it again. Your name is summation of your credibility. Credibility can be transferred. Your track record can be transferred. Your impact can be transferred. Respectfully speaking, it is at this point that I continue to charge our great families, especially in Africa, because um, we are yet to understand the power and the value of succession in Africa, you see. I think that many have done a good job here in the West because you will find families and dynasties that are decades years old and they are still being run there are values they preserve the name but you know in many many of the places in africa you find out that there's just one generation of everything it starts and dies with that generation the man is successful at 20 by 50 he's back to where he was and then he goes then the son comes paying the price of the father's carelessness begins his own journey and repeats the same thing God is speaking to someone. If names were not important, God would not change the names of men. In fact, he said, Oh Lord our God, how excellent is your name. How excellent is your name. If names are not powerful, ask the devil. What happens when you mention Jesus? If names are not powerful, do you know, at the end of your life, your name can become a key that opens a door or a padlock that closes that door. Your entire lifetime is to translate your name to become a key or a padlock. There are children today who have to change their names because if they were identified with certain names, it would close doors for them. And there are people who are in a hurry to claim certain names even if it's by extended relationship. 
it is not my son name, but just to let you know, I stayed 10 years in that house. Do I qualify? May your name be so great. Listen, please hear me. It is not, it is not, it is not enough to be great. Your name too must be great. I hope you know you can be great and your name is not great. Genesis chapter 12, in blessing Abraham, he said, I will bless you and make your name great. What then is the difference? He already said, I will bless you. Then he says, but I will not leave your name behind. A man can be blessed and yet your name is not great. When you are blessed alone, you enjoy that blessing in your lifetime. But when your name is great, others can carry that name even when you are not there. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. If authority was not invested in the name of Jesus, we would just read that the Son of God walked upon the earth, did exploits, and that's it. The early church will be a defeated church, but he left us his name. He invested all power and all glory in that name and said, go in my name. Your name. It means you must protect your name by all means. It is better to protect your name than to protect your money. Your money can go down and you will find it. But when your name goes down, it will take the grace of God to get it back up. Is God helping us this morning? Number three. The third thing you must transfer every father and every leader to your children are your relationships and connections. Relationships and connections are transferable. Your networks, relationships and connections. John 19, John 19 verse 26 and 27. John 19, very quickly and then I wrap up. John 19, 26 and 27. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said, watch this. Watch Jesus transfer relationships. This is Jesus on the cross. And John is standing there. And the mother is standing there. And here's what John says. Woman, behold thy son. Verse 27. And he said to the disciple, John, today this is now your mother. The Bible says, and from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Now, um... In Nigeria, where I come from, the northern part of Nigeria, um, most of the people, especially the Muslim community, they understand this principle powerfully. They transfer relationships. Oh, this is my son. Just to let you know that this has been my friend for 35 years, and um, now he's going to be the new CEO. Could you have dinner with him? Just discuss with him. Just get to know him. You can transfer relationships. Relationships are a leverage. You may have heard me say it in my teachings that all blessings come from God through man to man. All blessings come from God through man to man. All troubles come from Satan through man to man. In any case, men are prophetic midwives. Listen, if God says yes, and a man says no, your yes remains in the realm of the spirit. It takes a man. Otherwise, Gabriel would not come and be negotiating with a young virgin that Jesus is supposed to arrive, but we are looking for the human vessel who will partner with heaven to make it happen. And Mary said, be it unto me according to your word. That's how Jesus arrived. It is the desire of God that all men be saved. But where are the men that will take that gospel to the lost? All blessings come from God through men to men. Relationships are powerful. You must invest strategically and structurally in relationships. And there's no time to teach on relationships here. I would have taught you that there are four kinds of people that if you do not have in your life, you are in trouble. Number one, divine connectors. Number two, men of influence. Number three, gifted men. Number four, burden bearers. So every time you pray that God connects you to men, these are the kinds of men you should pray for. Your relationships. Every father must transfer your relationships, strategically so. Number four, what is the fourth thing that a father 
can transfer to your children your physical assets cash properties businesses can you see that what we have known to be inheritance is only number four and that's so in order of priority your convictions your name hallelujah your relationships and connections now your physical assets this was what the prodigal son received unfortunately he went straight for number four he ignored one two three watch the end of a young boy who only received money the Bible says let me quote very quickly one time this gentleman gets up and meets his father and said listen i know so much about inheritance i don't care whether you are dead or not you're wasting my time being alive give me that which and the father said really where did you get this orientation from i will honor you take i am a good man i will leave you an inheritance and the bible says as soon as he received it there were foolish friends already waiting for him is it in your Bible? As soon as he received it, they escorted him away from the gates of sanity, away from the place of wisdom. The Bible says he spent what he had because he did not have the conviction of his father. He did not respect the name of his father. He did not even respect the relationships that brought the father that status. All that he went for was the money. And the Bible says depletion started immediately. He got to a point where he was now feeding with swine. Question, where were all the friends? Where were all the people who celebrated him? And he was with the swine. But I love something the Bible says. He said he came to himself. He never said the Holy Spirit spoke to him. He never said the devil threatened him. Men can come to themselves. And sometimes, sometimes, don't be in a hurry to help somebody God is leaving to come to himself. Because there are people, the best gift you can give them is to leave them for a while until they recognize the value. Now, I'm not, I hope you are not, I hope you know, I'm not saying do not help people. But sometimes in a hurry to take people out of certain situations, they continue to recycle an entitlement mentality that will not allow them grow. So the prodigal son was there in his pain and in his silence. And he began to calculate a million dollars, $500,000. A hundred thousand dollars, then a few friends left. Ten thousand dollars, then a few more left. One dollar. Now I'm in debt and I'm left with peaks. He came to himself. The Bible says in Proverbs 18 and verse 1 true desire, a man having separated himself, the Bible says he seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. There is something about silence. When you, a gentleman can remain and say, look, being in this debt year after year, I'm tired. There has to be a way out. And I'm telling you, you can get up from that place of determination and end certain cycles in your life. That's what happened to the prodigal son. He didn't have the power to change himself, but he had the power to decide to change. And here's what he said. How many hired servants has my father and I am here feeding with the swine. He said, you know what? I've lost everything, but I still know that I have a father. I will arise. Here is a young man speaking to himself. And I will go to my father. And I will say, Father, I have sinned against you. We call that responsibility. I have sinned against you and against heaven. I am not worthy to be called your son. He says, take me as one of your servants. Now I cherish your convictions. I cherish your name. I know the power of being connected to you. I will not push you away for money again. I have, I've seen, I've seen the, the, the transient nature of money without a relationship. I'm willing to be a servant. It's not about the money. It's about you. Notice, the moment he took a step, the father too took a step. He never met the father at home. He met him somewhere in the middle of his responsibility steps. The father never met him in the rut. As soon as he said, I will go, 
the father left home and said there's something about me even though my son is a stubborn son he's still my son even though my son is is, is that not what happened between us and Jesus us and God the Bible says while we were yet sinners God was already putting together a plan however that life that he brought is not imparted till like the prodigal son you take that responsibility and take a step forward and so the gentleman takes a step and watch this as soon as he met the father the father never discussed anything about his destruction in other words the responsibility you have gotten is enough the message I would have told you you already got it by coming to yourself the Bible says he hugged him kissed him embraced him put back the signet ring and put a robe and brought him home and said listen we have to celebrate but there was another kind of son as I wrap up I hope you know that both of them did the same thing the, only, the first person did it in his heart the other person executed it it is not the story of one responsible son versus one lawless one it is a story of two sons who were on their way to destruction one only had the courage to take the first step you will learn at the later part of the story because the Bible says when a celebration was going on, the elder brother came and said, what is going on here? And they said, remember that your brother? He's back home. And so we're throwing a celebration and he was offended. The Bible says he went out and he left and a responsible father followed after him and said, what is wrong? He said, I am here and I've served you all the days of my life and you've not even given me, in other words, I, you've given me convictions, you are giving me relationship, but it's money I'm looking for about to make the mistake of his younger brother this gentleman who left you and went to spend his life with harlots and all of that he returns back and you receive him and you're celebrating him and then I've been here and all you give me is an advice every day be a responsible person come let me lay my hands on you in the name of Jesus you are great is that all you are going to give me And the father said something. Verse 29. Watch this. We're wrapping up. This is a message for someone. Next verse. And he answering him said to his father, Lo, this many years do I serve you. Neither transgress I at any time, yet you never gave me a kid that I may make merry with my friends. Verse 30. It says, But as soon as this your son, which had devoted his living with harlots, had and you have killed a fatted calf for him. I like the father's reply. Watch this. Next verse, please. And he said unto him, Son, you are ever with me here. You do not know that our relationship is an inheritance. This gentleman lost something precious. He said, All that I have. Question, what is the all? That means the money he gave the son was not all that he had. He gave the son money. And the son believed that he got everything from the father. But he said, there are other things this boy did not carry, but you have to. Hmm. When Abraham, Abraham had a total of about eight children. Ishmael, Isaac, and others that came. When it was time to bless his children, your Bible says that he called the children of all the concubines and he gave them gifts but to Isaac he gave everything he had there was no mention of any physical thing given to Isaac after he gave the boys gift they went away and he said Isaac come kneel down let me give you everything I have there will be nothing in your pocket when I'm done but you would have gotten everything that blessing that came upon me that leads me to the fifth inheritance that every man must give his son. The anointing and the mantle that made you you must be transferred to your children. Behind every great result, there are graces, there are anointings, there are mantles. Please write it down. You find this story in Genesis 25 from verse 1 to 11. We'll not read it for time. Hallelujah. So he gave all the other children things and they were happy. Maybe fighting with one another. Mine and yours which is bigger. 
and I'm, I, I can imagine Isaac standing and saying, so what, where, where is mine? No car, no house. What are you going to give me? And he says, come, let me place something upon your life. Because you see, the law is, thou anointest my head with oil, but he says, my cup runneth over. He does not anoint the cup. He anoints your head. That means your cup is a report card. It tells us what is on your head. If your cup is empty, don't blame the job. Don't blame the business. The business is only a physical expression. Thou anointest my head with oil. As a result of that anointing in Genesis 26 from verse 12, the Bible tells us that there was famine in a land. Is that in your Bible? Where every physical thing they had was going down. Isaac, having carried that blessing and that anointing, the Bible says he sowed in that land and received that same year an hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. 13. It says the man, Isaac, the man who had received that blessing from his father, he worked great, he went forward, and he grew until he became very great 14 for he had possessions goodness so what is on your head will eventually bring you the possessions of flocks herds a great store of servants and the philistines envied him we're reading to 16 it says for all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of abraham his father the philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth and Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us. He says, For thou art much mightier than we. What are the keys to receiving an inheritance from a father? There are two keys that the Bible gives. Number one is honor. Number two is service. You do not receive from a father just because you are his child there must be a track record of honor. Honor. If I be a father, Malachi chapter 1, from verse 6 to 8, where is my honor? If you claim I am your father, where is my honor? Do you know, physically, you can receive the baton, but in the spirit, you are not the successor. It is the one who showed honor that truly carries the grace. Now, I don't mean to insult your intelligence, but have you seen many families where at the end, the person who really carries the man's mantle are not the biological children. They can carry physical things, but when you look, you will know that this house help who has served for 15 years, Elisha was never, there is no prophecy about Elisha becoming a prophet. Elisha was a farmer. The prophet should come from among the sons of the prophet. But they got so familiar with that prophet, this is a man of God. But Elisha honored him and Elisha served. Two things. Let me charge every young man here as I wrap up. Never dishonor your father. Never dishonor your parents. No matter how right you are, you will pay for it. There are rules. When a father fights his son, he loses his honor. When a son fights his father, he loses his life. Hallelujah. That is the reason why God never fought Satan. You will never find God fighting Satan. It was Michael that went to fight Satan. Because if God fought Satan, even if he defeated him, Satan would still go to the earth as a victor to have made his father rise up to come and fight him. Fathers, don't fight sons. No. No. You delegate sons to deal with the matter. A father's honor is preserved when he does not fight his son. Sons, when you fight your father, that is what happened. Remember what happened between Noah? The Bible says Noah took wine and he slept and was naked. One of the sons came and saw him. He saw his father's nakedness. He rejoiced, called the other brothers and said, Can you imagine? Even though the man was drunk, he still knew who looked at him. When he got up from that state, he said, who did this? He was not told. Your father may have backslidden, pray for his revival and restoration, but at no point should you dishonor him. There are certain things only fathers can carry, and there are certain things only age can bring. 
in their fallen state they will look at you and bless you i am a product of many many blessings many many blessings you may have heard my story one time i went to buy something and i met two women and i decided to honor them two women very unassuming women and i decided to honor them i said please don't pay for it let me pay it was not it was not anything not even up to I, i'm not sure it was up to a dollar and the women began to bless me and one of the women looked at me and said my son forever walk upon gold i'm wrapping up now years ago i went to preach for those of us who are nigerians in afe babalola university many years ago and i went to preach there and i stopped and i was i, I think i flew to one of the the states and then to go by road getting there and i passed a very small and strange village where people lived mysteriously long i saw obituaries of 100 and something 100 and something i said what in the world is this what kind of grace is this and when i was done ministering on my way back to the airport i said stop i saw a notice 136 years the man just died i said stop now i'm not a yoruba person but i said look for someone for us let me find the oldest man in this village i want to sow into his life and have him speak over my life because i'm going to be traveling to the nations no plane will kill me no no whatever it is but listen just shouting amen alone is not the key i understand the blessings that come from fathers and when we got there we found a man who could speak limited english i'm wrapping up now and then he took us to a man we entered a room and we met a man and then they interpreted i will speak and they will interpret these are young men who just came wanting to receive the blessing and the man laughed you see but those who carry this thing know they have it believe me you provoke it to honor and the man said kneel down and now you're a man of god or kneel down i want to release it upon you and he began to pray and to bless me to rain those blessings i felt like a crown was being put on my head while he was speaking literally when he was done we sowed into his life we blessed him and when i was about to get into the car i saw some women standing and then they told me that the man that died one 36 year old man that was his wife standing i said let's go back i went back and i prostrated i greeted i said the man may be dead but you are one so he's still alive in you can you pray for me now watch this i'm wrapping up this woman laughs and says follow me and then I enter a room with her and she begins to show me old photos this was the wife of his youth old and you know those days they married very early the wife of his youth what happened that God preserved them what kind of grace did they carry when they were done I said please for God's sake would you release what was upon you and your husband on me and the woman took off her shoes she said kneel down she stood on her bare foot and she said kneel down for about 15 minutes this woman from the heart of a mother i honestly did not care what she was saying all i was concerned about was the fact that it was a heart to heart connection i'm going to make one request as we wrap up i'm going to ask at the end of this respectfully so pastor gandhi representing the fathers here to speak over this congregation i know he has been your pastor for many years i'm not asking the pastor to speak you've heard the pastor for many years i'm asking the father to speak he that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet you can receive a prophet in the name of your brother you will receive discussions and news about the family situation you can receive in the name of whatever it is have you learned something i went for a meeting and in that meeting a man gave a story that changed my life very great man a church like this 
and they were telling us the story. Things were going bad in his house, yet the church was excelling. The church was doing well, whereas his family was not doing well. One time, just like our mother here, a sermon is going on, and you can imagine, she just got up and walked out of the church. Literally, she walked out of the church. And the pastor was touched, confused. What is going on now? He was done preaching, finished counseling, and rushed home. And he said, my wife, what is wrong? Did I offend you? Did I say something? Not a word. He sat down at the table to eat. And then here's this woman serving her husband of many years. And he noticed the tray that she brought was different. You know that tray that women keep for special occasions? She brought it out. And he said, please, my food, we've been married for years. Let's leave these children. You should bring, I'm hungry. Not a word from her. Set the table with honor with respect, with regard and then she brought the last item on the table and she got down on her knees and she said, God's servant, my family is in trouble the man looked at his wife and said he felt that same anointing that he would feel when he was in church since I've been relating with you just as a wife, it is not the, wife, the husband dimension I'm looking for. That father, that grace that produces the testimonies that we only hear in church and cannot come to my life. Now I'm taking responsibility. This is not your wife. This is one who has submitted to your grace. And he said he laid his hands on his wife and began to prophesy that everything that has plagued her home, which is also his home, and miracles began to happen. I will stop here. Abba, Father.